Hi, I'm Hartley Peavy, and you're watching the Musician Network. Stay tuned. So we are here with the legendary Hartley Peavy. Good day. Thank you. Thank How, you. How's Nam been so far? Well, it's been pretty good. I uh, spent all last week at the Consumer Show, uh, Consumer Electronics yes, Show yes. in Las Vegas. So yeah. I'm almost showed out, but yeah. uh, no, it's been pretty good. We. Uh, as usual, we always have a bunch of new goodies. That's kind of what uh, excites me is the ability to come up with new stuff. That's sure. that's really where it's at for me because um, I'm basically a, an inventor. Yeah, yeah uh, you, you started off quite young, actually. Yeah, I uh, I had the good fortune to grow up in a music store, uh -huh. and I also had the good fortune to grow up in a very interesting place at a very interesting time. The place was Mississippi and the time was in the latter 1950s. And my dad was a music dealer and I had several jobs, one of which was buying records. Mm -hmm. And I remember when What Did I Say by Ray Charles came out, I almost played the record till the needle went through the, the vinyl. But um, I got to meet a lot of musicians and in 1957, I went to a Bo Diddley concert in Laurel, Mississippi and I got a crazy idea that I wanted to be a guitar player. And I went to my dad and asked him to give me a guitar, and he said, well, I'll get you some lessons, and if you learn to play, then... Get you a guitar. Yeah. But, of course, like any kid, I wanted it right then. And long story short, I built my own guitar out of old parts, and then once I had the guitar, I asked him for an amp, same story. So I built an amp, and a friend of mine saw it, and he said, well, if you'll build me an amp like that, I'll give you some lessons, and I did, and he did. And I spent eight years trying to be a player, and that really wasn't my cup of tea. Yeah. And after getting kicked out of several bands after I built all the gear that they needed, uh, I figured that my future as a rock star might be in jeopardy, so I did one of the hardest things I've ever had to do, is I had to look in the mirror and be totally honest with myself, and I said, well, okay, big boy, you're not gonna be a rock star, what are you gonna do? Almost every musician that I ran into said, well, you know, I wish somebody would build good gear at a fair price. And mind you, this was when the Beatles were big. Sure. And, um, all these people were out there, the Rolling Stones. Well, you know all the names. Oh, yeah, absolutely. So lots of people had amplifiers, but very few had sound systems. And the sound systems were there were around a 1000 bucks back then. Which is quite now, a bit. Yeah, well, if you want to get a feeling for what it would be today, just multiply that by 10. Yeah. Because, I mean, uh, Gasoline was like uh, 32 cents a gallon at that time, and now it's over three dollars. So that'll give you. And a Vox, a Vox Super Beetle was uh, 1,500 bucks. Yeah. So if you want to know what that would cost today, basically 15k. So that was the environment that I came in there. And coming from a technical background, I took a bunch of shop courses when I was in high school. I would count up all the parts, and I would say, you know, it's ridiculous for a 100 watt tube head to sell for a thousand dollars I can do it a whole lot less than that and I did so that's how I got into business and when I graduated um, from college in 1965 uh, 45 and a half years ago I started PB and it's been a it's been quite an education a lot of people that go to school they think that when they get the diploma uh, they're they're set but I've discovered that a diploma really is not much more than a learner's permit. Sure, absolutely. And I've certainly learned a lot in my 45 and a half years. Uh, in June, it'll be 46 years. And good Lord willing, I've got another, you know, yeah, we'll 10 see or 12 20 years. years here at the show for sure. Well, you know, I, I I went to my first NAM show, would you believe, in 1954 with my dad, and you know. I don't get too excited about shows anymore because I've been to so many. Sure. Uh, but it's fun, and, and when we come, we always have something new. Exactly. And that's, that's kind of... And people are excited about it. Well, that, that keeps my interest because, exactly. you know, you don't find many people that can hang in there as long as I have. But I have this kind of crazy idea that business is kind of like a rodeo. The winner is the one that can stay on the pony the longest. And as I look around, I don't see many people that have been around. Yeah, you've probably seen them come and go. I've seen many come and go. A lot of people, a lot smarter than me, but they they got bucked or, off the yeah. pony one way or the other. And I'm thankful that uh, we've had great support from artists and customers. And I listen to them, and uh, I, I started out 
back in 65, not to be the biggest, not to be the most profitable, but to be the best. And by definition, you can't be the best without being different, and we are. Absolutely. And a lot of people don't understand, you know, that companies are different. The fact is, a lot of people think that, you know, you can look at the price of something and somehow buy that, judge the quality, uh, judge the, quality the reliability, and, and the fact is, I ask people sometimes if they believe that you get what you pay for it. Almost every time, people say, yeah. And I said, well, have you ever bought a concert ticket for big bucks and you went to the show and it sucked? Oh, yeah. Everybody's done that. Well, did you get what you paid for? Yeah. See, the dumbest thing anybody could do is to assume that all companies operate the same. Like, after all these years, I'm still head of my company. And I do things that a board of directors, frankly, wouldn't let me do, uh, simply because it costs more. Our speakers, our Blackwood speakers, yeah, our Scorpion legendary. speakers, have field replaceable baskets. Because we do business in 130 countries, and if you're in Nigeria, let's say, and you Shipping want a speaker, big, inch, you're in big trouble yeah. with everybody else's speaker. With mine, you take out three bolts, put on another cone assembly, boom, you're back in yeah. business. And it costs us five or six dollars more per speaker to do that. Yeah. But and, it's cost effective for the customer. Well, it is. You know, to me, happiness is never having to say I'm sorry. Exactly. And we work with artists. Unlike some of our competitors, PV doesn't have a signature sound. Uh, some of my friendly competitors that have been around for a long, long time, even longer than me, um, the only thing that's really different about their amplifiers is the speaker complement and the power. The preamp's exactly the same. Yeah. Well, we build amps specifically for rock and roll and blues people, our classic series. We build amps for the heavy metal people like our um, Triple X and our 6505. Yeah, 65 and I mean, if you if I gave one of our classics to a heavy metal guy, he wouldn't like it. Sure. And if I took a 6505 and gave it to some country rock guy, he wouldn't like that either. I have seen a lot of guys play those, though. Yeah, well, they, they, they do, but you see, you know, the country rock thing is like today, in my day, um, today's country would have been considered rock and roll. Oh, absolutely. And you see, a lot of people think rock and roll started in New York or they started in uh, L.A., but it started right along the banks of the Mississippi River from New Orleans up to um, about, uh, oh, I guess St. Louis with Chuck Berry there and Fats Domino and Little Richard and, you know, all those people and along Elvis, Mississippi sure. Boy, B.B. King, Bo Diddley, all these people. Our little place is the home of American music yeah. in, in every sense of the word. And I had the good fortune to grow up there and music is a part of me. And since I first saw the light of day, the music business has been my bread and butter. Still is. And again, hopefully, until I leave this world, it will be my bread and butter. Yeah. But the biggest thing is I'm learning a lot. I learn something every day and I'm having fun. And that's why I'm still doing what exactly. I'm doing. Exactly. And that's, that's yeah. crucial for being yeah. this long. And you guys are still coming up with innovative products. Year well, year. you know, Sadly, a lot of people in the music business and sound business, they have what I call a cowpath mentality. And if you look in here, there's thousands and thousands of acoustic guitars. Everyone looks just like every other one. There may be minor differences in electric guitars pretty much the same way. But we do things like um, I was mentioning earlier, we bought a company last year actually called Composite Acoustics uh -huh. that makes graphite guitars. And graphite is a, is a very interesting aerospace material. And a lot of people don't know about what's called the Lacey Act. Uh -huh. And the Lacey Act was a bill passed in Washington to protect, protect flora and fauna and trees sure. and all this kind of stuff. And there's really two problems. A lot of the countries that grow, third world countries that grow so-called tone woods, they don't want to export the lumber. They want to export finished product, but they don't know how to do it. And when you bring it into the United States, you've got paperwork, all this, and sometimes one of my friendly competitors bought some, some wood in Germany, and now they're, I mean, it's a big bad deal. Yeah. So we feel like that that's gonna be more and more of a problem as time goes on. And musicians have always complained about, you know, the fret sticking out on the side, or, and, and, and you know, you put a guitar in a case, you fly to London to do a gig and you get out and everything. But this stuff, you could use this as a boat paddle. 
and it's, it's a lot of very interesting things, like most acoustic guitars have a big old heel. Oh, yeah. Notice yeah. that there's no heel. You can literally go all the way up. You couldn't do that. Oh, yeah, no, absolutely. And that's the wonderful thing about this, but it requires a totally new technology. Uh -huh. And I mean, we're electronic people. We've been working with wood for years. As a matter of fact, when we first started doing guitars, I'd been through some of the factories and they were doing it by the most crude methods you can imagine. So I said, well, uh, I'm gonna do it the right way. And I've always been a gun collector. Uh -huh. And I said, well, however they make mass produced gun stocks, we can make guitar necks that way because you can't take a piece of paper and slip it between the, the metal and the wood. So we found that machine and we did that, we, we brought uh, computer controlled CNC uh, router profilers, and at the time a lot of people said, well, it can't be done. Today, everybody's doing it that way. We did it back in 76, 77, and introduced guitars in 78, and we've been making guitars ever since. This is a, another departure because this, again, is a totally different technology. And, you know, we, we call this the forever guitar. You could literally get in a canoe and, <laughs> and paddle it. And in fact, if you look at our stand over there, we've got one of these in a waterfall. Wow. Now the strings might rust, that's okay. but the guitar is not yeah, going to yeah. change. And you see, that's an example of doing something a different way. It Do it a different way and hopefully a better way. And for the musicians of the world, I think that's what they're looking for. Absolutely. So that's the way it has been at PV for over 45 years, and as long as I'm there, that's the way it's going to be. That's, that's great. Happiness is never having to say I'm sorry. Exactly. <laughs> and you've had your own path and done it very well. Yeah. Okay. We appreciate you coming All on. Right. Thanks Once again, Harley PV, the legend on okay. Musician Network. Okay. Stay tuned.